by introducing uh, the lecturer for uh, this series of lectures here. So Yassini um, did his PhD at Caltech and then postdocs in Princeton and Johns Hopkins. And then he's uh, is at NYU uh, since a few years ago. And he's a uh, world renowned, renowned specialist in the physics of the microwave background. And which is the topic that he'll be teaching to us here in these lectures. So it's a great pleasure to have Yassin and Yassin, just go ahead whenever you feel like it. Okay, well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure also to be uh, giving these lectures, even though I would have much preferred to be there in person, obviously, but everyone have been, has been saying this. Okay, let me start by a general comment on the kind of stuff you will learn at this kind of school. So I was a student myself not too long ago, and I do remember feeling sometimes overwhelmed at this, uh, kind of schools. So you should know that obviously cosmology is a huge topic. Even the CMB itself is a huge topic that you cannot possibly learn in only five hours of lectures. So if sometimes it goes too fast, you know, it's not because you have an issue. It's normal. It's just an encouragement for you to go and learn, you know, read, for example, Dolson and Schwitz books or any textbook to learn in more detail. So this should be a motivation for you to learn more, basically. So I will start, this lecture will be with uh, PowerPoints and then the, uh, my next lectures will be, at least uh, three next lectures will be um, uh, whiteboard uh, or like handwritten notes. Um, so I will start today by setting the general stage uh, of what we're gonna be doing. Okay. So I will start by uh, some very basic definitions. We're talking, so what is this cosmic microwave background? First and foremost, it's an electromagnetic radiation that permeates the universe. So we need some tools to be able to describe it. So we can describe it by its specific intensity. This has dimensions of units, uh, energy per unit time, per unit frequency, per unit solid angle, per uh, unit area, I, the specific intensity. This depends on frequency of the photons and on the direction of propagation of photons. Equivalently, we can describe any electromagnetic radiation by its photon occupation number, which I will call F. This is the number of photons per quantum related just by two times, this is the Planck constant HP times nu cubed times F. And equivalently, just again to set the language, because sometimes I will say phase space density instead of photon occupation number, these two quantities are related by a constant. Okay, and the phase space density of photons is the number of photons per cubic uh, volume and per cubic volume of momentum. So per phase space uh, volume. So this is just to set, to set the language. Okay, if we have a perfect black body, it has a photon occupation number F, which is just one over e to the h nu over t minus one. Okay, here I'm gonna use that the Boltzmann constant, I'm gonna set it to one throughout these lectures. And H nu is just the energy of the photon. So it's one over exponential energy of the photon over T minus one. For a generic radiation, doesn't have to be black body. What I measure again is either the specific intensity or this photon occupation number F. I can always invert this relation. I can define a temperature T by just inverting this relationship. It doesn't have to be black body radiation, but I can always define a temperature. Okay, which in this case would depend on energy and direction of propagation of the photon. So now if I have this function T here that I've defined this way, either as a function of energy or frequency, if it was, it can have a piece which is completely independent of frequency and of direction. This is the CMB monopole. It can, has, it can have pieces which depends on energy or frequency, but do not depend on direction on the sky. This is what we call CMB spectral distortions. This is just to set the vocabulary. It can have pieces which do not depend on frequency, but do depend on the direction on the sky. Those are called CMB anisotropies. And finally, it can have also pieces which depend on both frequency and uh, direction on the sky. Those are spectral and spatial distortions. And for example, the sunyaev zeldovich effect is an example of um, such a distortion. We will not talk about this in this lecture. I will focus on CMB and isotropies. Okay, so this was just to set the stage. And now let me give you a little bit of a brief uh, historical introduction. So in 1965 is when 
the cosmic microwave background was first experimentally uh, discovered. So Penzas and Wilson, and Wilson, what they did is they detected an excess radiation compared to what they, their noise was to be at a frequency of four gigahertz. Again, what they measured is not a full spectrum, they just measured one single number, a total intensity of radiation. They convert this to a temperature and this corresponds to about a three degree Kelvin radiation. And this was interpreted as the cosmic microwave background by Dickey, Peebles, Roland Wilkinson. So again, this is just to show you that at the time, there was only this one single number here, just an overall amplitude from which we can translate to a temperature, but we had at that time, no idea of the spectrum of the CMB. It took 25 years before COBE, and specifically the FIRES instrument on board COBE, could measure the full frequency spectrum of the CMB and indeed show that it was consistent with a perfect black body spectrum, i.e. that the deviations away from a perfect black body spectrum, the spectral distortions, were consistent within the instrumental uh, errors. And specifically now we have upper limits on the spectral distortions to be below one part in 10 to the four. Uh, in addition, COBE virus measured the CMB temperature very, very precisely to 2.7255 plus or minus uh, 0.6 millikelvin uh, error bar. Okay. So I want to take a small aside now to talk about spectral distortions of the CMB. So the majority of these lectures will be about CMB and isotropies, but I will, because spectral distortions are an important aspect, I will not have time to cover them, but I will make a small aside here. So and the, 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 here the physics is why does the CMB have a black body spectrum and what can we learn from the fact that the CMB has a black body spectrum versus something that is deviating away from a black body. So suppose we start in the early universe uh, where with photons having a perfect uh, black body spectrum. So if we don't add new photons, if we don't add new energy to this, uh, spectrum because phase space density is conserved or photon occupation number is conserved. This is called Liouville's theorem. We'll get back to it. Photons retain a, a black body spectrum whose temperature decays as one over the, the scale factor of the universe. Now, I'll get back to this definition if you are not familiar with it. Now, suppose that in the process there is some uh, mechanism that injects additional energy into the photons either through the form of uh, additional photons or perhaps something that heats up the photons. If this process injects its energy at a time prior, you know, between the Big Bang and two months after the Big Bang, this corresponds to redshift of 2 million for those familiar with this concept, then this energy will get completely thermalized by two processes. Uh, there is, first of all, free free. Uh, radiation and double Compton scattering described here. So free free radiation is when electrons and protons, uh, as electrons get accelerated by protons, they will radiate photons and double Compton scattering is like Thomson scattering, except that in the end state you have two photons. So these processes can not only change the energy of photons, but also can create and destroy photons. And so this will lead to thermalizing any energy injection. At the end, you get back a black body spectrum with a, just a different temperature. So basically, whatever happens between the Big Bang and two months later, we have no way of observing, me, observing it in terms of its imprint uh, on the spectrum of the CMB. It would just result in a perfect black body. There are other ways of observing it, but that's a different question. Now, if you inject energy between two months after the Big Bang and 300 years or so after the Big Bang, where it shifts 50,000, these processes of Bramshaw and double Compton are no longer efficient. And so photons can no longer be efficiently created or destroyed. However, we have good old Thomson scattering of photons with electrons. And this, as we will see a little bit later, can change the photon energy. Uh, and in, at these epochs, it can do, the, do so efficiently. So now if you have a process that can efficiently shuffle energies around, but cannot change its number, you will reach a uh, Bose-Einstein distribution with not necessarily a, uh, with a priori a non-zero chemical potential mu. So if you inject energy in the early universe between these epochs, this will distort the, the CMB photon um, uh, frequency spectrum away from a perfect black body by giving it a chemical potential, which is of the order of the fractional energy injected. So the total integral of energy injected per unit time integrated over time over the energy density of photons. <clears throat> 
And if you inject now energy after this 300 year mark, it will not be thermalized at all. And so you will get a black body, uh, a photon spectrum, which will be distorted away from a black body spectrum. The specific shape of that distortion will depend on exactly how you inject the energy. But the overall amplitude of this distortion, delta, will be again of the order of the total energy uh, injected over time divided by the total energy uh, in photons. Okay. So all this was a bit of an aside to say that, unfortunately, I will not go into the details of CMB spectral distortions, even though they're a very interesting topic on their own. Um, however, the fact that the CME is observed to be uh, very close to a perfect black body implies that we have some really stringent constraints on any exotic uh, energy injection scenarios starting two months after the Big Bang and onwards. So in the uh, remaining lectures, we will focus on CMB anisotropies. Okay, we will assume that the CMB has a perfect black body spectrum. We will no longer be concerned by deviations of the frequency spectrum away from a perfect black body. And we will focus on the temperature fluctuations from one part of the sky to the other. Okay. Uh, so these were first, the first full map, full sky map of temperature anisotropies was uh, made by the COBE satellite in the early 90s. Since then, as I'm sure you are uh, most aware, the uh, CMB full sky uh, map has been measured by the WMAP satellite and by the Planck satellite. There are also many experiments uh, from the ground that measure some uh, fraction of the sky to much greater sensitivity than any of these experiments. In addition to the CMB temperature maps, the CMB radiation is actually polarized. And this also has been mapped. So this Planck's W map, and then now the Planck satellite has made a full map uh, of the polarization of the CMB. And we will discuss this a little bit uh, in the last lecture, probably. Also something that I will touch on very briefly, uh, most likely in the last lecture is CMB lensing. So along the line of sight, we will see that CMB photons mostly come from uh, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, mostly come from redshift about 1100. And we will quantify what I mean by this later on. So between that and now, CMB photons are gravitationally lensed by uh, structure. Uh, and so this effect can be measured in the CMB uh, statistics of the CMB maps. And this is a way to indirectly probe the formation of structure between redshift of 1100 and today. So um, all this to say that nowadays, uh, the CMB has, uh, as you know, become a pillar of high precision uh, cosmology. So these curves here are the CMB temperature and polarization power spectra. This is the variance of temperature fluctuations or anisotropies or the variance of polarization as a function of angular scale. I'll discuss this a little bit later on. But basically, the blue points are the data measured by Planck, and the red curve is the theoretical model that I will spend some of these lectures telling you what are the ingredients in calculating this theoretical model. This theoretical model only depends, in the simplest case, on six uh, cosmological parameters. And by comparing the theory with uh, the data, uh, from CMB observations, we have been able to measure these six cosmological parameters, which again, I will describe in more detail, to an extreme uh, precision. For example, the fraction of uh, dark matter uh, in the universe, uh, as illustrated here. If you try to have less dark matter, then you will completely mess up the fit to the data. So uh, before uh, now starting to give you a little bit more details, so I'm going to tell you a bit of the story of the CMB. So I have to introduce what are the protagonists of the story and what is the stage. So one of the important protagonists here are baryons, i.e. in the cosmologist uh, language, baryons are electrons, protons, helium nuclei. So we're going to start our story uh, after, uh, way after big bang nucleosynthesis. And so there are uh, something like 24% of helium by mass, which corresponds to 8% by number. You're going to be asked in the homework to show this correspondence. Then, why isn't it working? Our main protagonist, of course, is the photons. CMB photons are something like 10 to the, a few times 10 to the 9 photons per 
hydrogen atom. And again, you can ask, ask to compute this specifically in the homework. Neutrinos are almost as abundant as photons. Neutrinos, contrary to photons, do not interact at the times of interest for us, do not interact with anything else. So they are collisionless. And neutrinos start relativistic, we'll describe them in more detail, but they're basically, neutrinos are effectively like a dark matter in the sense that they're collisionless, but they are not cold dark matter, they are hot. They have large uh, residual thermal motions from the time that they couple. And finally, cold dark matter, which as far as I know, we don't know what it is. If someone, someone knows, you should uh, tell everyone. So cold dark matter, cold means pressureless, something whose pressure is negligible. And dark means, again, just like for neutrinos, collisionless. All of those interact through, are connected through uh, the laws of uh, gravitation. And there is a very spe special relationship between photons and baryons, which is that they exchange energy and momentum through Thomson scattering for uh, the first 400 uh, and 400,000 years or so. They're tightly coupled for the first 400,000 years or so of the universe. So we will uh, study in particular this relationship uh, in more detail in these lectures, although it will not be in full detail. Okay, the stage now on which the story unfolds is the Freeman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker space time. And, and specifically, it is a perturbed uh, FLRW space time. Let me start by describing the unperturbed, the background space time. So, uh, hopefully, if you're not familiar with general relativity, you will still be able to understand uh, most of the content of this class. But to study cosmology in detail, you will need to have a background in general relativity. So, this is the space time metric. This is the background space time metric here. A is the so-called scale factor. It quantifies the expansion, uh, the size, the physical size of, um, sorry, physical lengths at any given time relative to physical lengths today. It is equal to unity today. X here is equal moving coordinates and eta is the conformal time and T here is the coordinate time. If, uh, the, if you consider any particle and if it doesn't interact with any other particle, if it's just, uh, moving freely along geodesics in this background universe, its momentum is going to redshift. Its momentum as observed by observers which are sitting still in these X coordinates will redshift as one over the scale factor. One over the scale factor is defined as one plus Z, the cosmological redshift. Okay, the Hubble rate is the rate of change of the scale factor, the logarithmic rate of change of the scale factor with respect to time. And this Hubble rate uh, is, so the so-called Hubble constant is nothing but the Hubble rate today uh, at the present time. One of the famous, the big tensions in cosmology is the so-called Hubble tension, which is the fact that the Hubble constant or Hubble parameter today is measured to be 67 plus or minus half uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec from CMB and isotropies, but one can also try and measure this from local measurements, see how things, how fast things expand away uh, from us, and uh, these local measurements give a value which is higher and which is in tension uh, with the, the CMB measurements. So I'm not going to go into uh, details about this. Uh, I know this is about the tensions, but I'm hoping to give you some of the tools to understand how one infer this number from uh, CMB measurements. So, and at a general redshift, the Hubble expansion rate is related to the mean densities of photons, neutrinos, cold dark matter, baryons, and cosmological constants by the Friedman's equation. So it relates Hubble squared to the sum of all the mean densities in the universe. So most of you probably know all this. I just want to make sure that everyone is up to page. So how do these densities evolve? So first of all, the mean number densities of anything, any, if any particle whose number is conserved as the universe expands, its number density per physical uh, volume goes as one over the scale factor cubed. So if we have a non-relativistic species, for example, cold dark matter or baryons, then the mass or energy density, we're going to assume C equals to one in these lectures, 
is proportional to the mean number density times the mass of this particle. So this also goes as one over a cubed. Radiation, uh, the uh, mean energy density of radiation goes as the mean number density of photons, which goes as one over a cubed times the characteristic momentum of photons. And this I told you goes as one over a. So overall, this goes as one over a to the fourth. And massive neutrinos, which I will describe in more detail in a few minutes, but neutrinos are something which start uh, as radiation when their temperature is much higher than their masses and then become behave like matter once their temperature falls below their masses. Lastly, just to introduce notation again, to make sure everyone is up to page, the dimensionless uh, density parameters are just, you take the Friedman equation at uh, present time at redshift zero and you define these ratios. In a flat, spatially flat universe, the sum of these omegas is unity. And I'm gonna only talk about flat, spatially flat universe here. And so if I rewrite the Friedman equation, it becomes H squared is the Hubble uh, constant, Hubble parameter today squared times the sum of these omegas with the proper scaling. Uh, A to the minus three for matter, A to the minus four for radiation and some uh, scale dependence for neutrinos. Another notation which is frequently used is that the Hubble constant today is defined at 100 times little h kilometers per second per mega parsec. So this is a bit of a historically dated notation now because we know that little h is 0.7 plus or minus a very small error bar, but still this is what it has been, is still used currently. And uh, we can also use the small omegas to uh, denote omega, big omega times h squared because those are the quantities that actually come into the expansion rates. Always this to uh, hopefully if people have no, no knowledge of cosmology, uh, you have learned something today. Uh, now, uh, the stage of the study of the CMB is not the Friedman Lumetre Robertson Walker metric, but the perturbed uh, FLRW metric. So here I'm adding perturbation. So this psi corresponds to the Newtonian potential. This phi is basically another version of the Newtonian potential. Those are two scalar perturbations. And then there are also gravitational wave perturbations. We will focus mostly on this part here of the metric, but know that there are more components. OK, so I've told you about the stage, this Freeman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric. Now let's talk a little bit about the protagonists of the story. I'm going to start by the protagonist, which I'm not going to talk too much about in these lectures. The first one is called dark matter. So this is going to be the realm of the lectures by Fabian Schmidt. Okay. So cold dark matter still matters very much for CMB and isotropies, but I'm not going to talk about its physics very much because its physics, as far as CMB and isotropies are concerned, are very simple. This is approximated as a collisionless, pressureless ideal fluid. So the fact that it's pressureless means that it's and it's an ideal fluid. We can describe it entirely by its density and velocity fields. Again, this is as far as CMB is concerned, all of those uh, need not be hold true when you want to study cold dark matter in the nonlinear universe. So as far as the CMB anisotropies are concerned, uh, to describe cold dark matter, all we need are really two equations. We need to have a continuity equation, which is stating that the mass is conserved, uh, and a momentum equation which says that the dark matter velocity changes according to uh, Newton's laws. Okay, and so of course we want the relativistic generalization of these equations, but the relativistic generalizations are not much more complex there than this. They're basically exactly the same form with some slightly different, slight difference uh, in the potentials. So again, I'm not going to talk with, about this, but there's a very rich physics in uh, cold dark matter gravitational collapse in the nonlinear universe, and this will be the topic of Fabian's lectures. Neutrinos. Neutrinos are effectively hot dark matter. Okay, so unlike, just like cold dark matter, they're collisionless. This is the dark part, but they don't have, uh, they do have pressure. They have large thermal motions. So neutrinos also, I'm not going to talk about them in more detail, but these are an important ingredient to any of the calculations, the detailed calculations of CMB and isotropies. So there are three neutrinos plus anti-neutrinos flavors. 
there are three different mass eigenstates of neutrinos, which are not, which are linearly uh, related. Uh, the, the, the eigenstates, the, the mass states are linearly related to the flavor eigenstates, but they're not equal to them. Measurements uh, of neutrino oscillations give us some handle on the difference of neutrino mass squares, but not on the individual masses. From cosmology, we uh, can have infer so far upper limits on the sum of the neutrino masses. And those are getting tighter and tighter to the point of almost being able to measure the neutrino masses. And current, those are the current limits from Planck, 0.12 eV. So neutrinos decouple at a temperature of about a mega electron volt uh, from the plasma. At that moment, because of the, their masses are less than you know, a 40 or a 10th of an electron volt, they're clearly ultra relativistic. And so as they decouple, they uh, decouple relativistically and they have a, a Fermi Dirac uh, occupation number. Okay, so again, just like we described F for photons, we also have an occupation number for neutrinos and Fermi Dirac has a plus here. The neutrino's temperature is a little bit less than the, the photon temperature because uh, shortly after they decouple, electrons and positrons annihilate and give a little bit more energy to uh, photons than to neutrinos. So uh, we are only concerned for symbiotic entropies with temperatures much below an MeV. So they're completely decoupled from the plasma. They are collisionless. And as a consequence, as I was briefly mentioning before, in the absence of collision, there is a theorem, which is Liouville's theorem, which is not so difficult to actually prove, but you can look at it if that's of interest to you, which says that the phase space density, hence the occupation number, because they're related by a constant, is conserved along the trajectories of particles. So this leads for neutrinos to be collisionless Boltzmann equation, which is saying that the neutrino occupation number or phase space density does not change along trajectories. And this total derivative here is just partial time derivative plus dx dt, blah, blah, blah. This is all the, just the chain rule to say that uh, this is zero. And we're gonna use the same thing for photons, except that it's not gonna be equal to zero. Okay. So as I said, cold dark matter neutrinos, I just wanted to put them out there. So you know that uh, there are lots of ingredients that need to be accounted for. The main uh, uh, protagonists of the story for the CMB are baryons and photons. But of course, neutrinos and cold dark matter matter very much in terms of the calculations of uh, the detailed CMB anisotropies. So as I said, baryons in cosmology means electrons, ions, neutral atoms. Again, we're only considering temperatures much less than MeV for all the scales which are observable for CMB anisotropies. Uh, so the baryons are all non-relativistic, including the electrons. As I mentioned briefly before, there's uh, the, some helium with 24% helium by mass. And this corresponds to 8% by number. You're asked to show this as, as an exercise. It's just a simple conversion. So just like dark matter, uh, baryons are described as an ideal fluid, except here it's a much uh, truer statement than for dark matter, uh, because it remains, uh, it actually remains true even in the nonlinear universe, and except in very specific cases. So they are described, but they are not uh, cold, ideal fluid, so they have a temperature. Uh, so they're described by the, their density, and this delta here is the over density, the density perturbation compared to the mean density. So the overline, the bars here mean, means mean variables, their velocity and their temperature. And we're gonna talk about briefly uh, tomorrow about the evolution of their temperature. So just like cold dark matter, baryons are described by slightly more complicated equations than cold dark matter, but not that much more complicated. So there's a continuity equation, which is the same, which is just sa says that the, the number of baryons or the mass of baryons is conserved. There's a momentum equation, which has, and I'm sorry, I should have a capital D in the bottom here. So the dv dt is just minus grad phi. Okay, this is just like for cold dark matter, but there's an additional term, which is the fact that due to the fact that baryons exchange momentum with photons. So there's basically a drag force uh, due to Thomson scattering with photons. And lastly, they also have a temperature which is non-zero. And so this temperature evolves according to uh, again, the photon, baryons and photons exchange uh, heat. And so there is some heating term 
uh, that couples the baryon temperature to the photons. And of course, all of these must be written in a full relativistic setup, but it doesn't look fundamentally uh, different from this, okay? Okay, one of the um, uh, complications or uh, interesting pieces of physics of baryons is that, well, baryons have bound states, okay? Hydrogen uh, protons and electrons can form neutral hydrogen atoms. And this matters very much, and as we will see, to CMB and isotropies. So an important thing that we will, we will discuss tomorrow is the process of recombination. How do helium nuclei go from fully ionized to doubly ionized to then singly ionized and then to uh, neutral? And how do electrons and protons combine for the first time to form neutral hydrogen atoms? Even though it's for the first time, we call it historically, for historical reasons, recombination. This happens at a, something like three to 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which corresponds to a redshift of about 1100, corresponds to a time when all the physical scales in the universe were a factor of a thousand smaller than what they are today. Lastly, so I described briefly, cold dark matter, briefly neutrinos, baryons, and lastly, photons on which we will focus in the next two lectures. Photons, i.e. the cosmic wave background, as I mentioned in the first slides, they are described by their photon occupation number or equivalently their phase space distribution. They are neither an ideal fluid nor collisionless in general. In fact, they are either one of them, approximately an ideal fluid, or they are approximately collisionless, but they're not both at the same time. And so they are described because they're not collisionless, by the collisional Boltzmann equation. So the change of the photon occupation number along trajectories is given by some collision operator uh, of the photon occupation number. It's the Thomson collision operator. So we will spend uh, the entire third lecture uh, just deriving this equation in the uh, Newtonian limit, and I will tell you how it generalizes uh, to general relativity. And then we will spend lecture four understanding uh, its, its solutions in uh, different regions, okay? Because the solution of this equation is kind of the key to uh, CMB anisotropies. So to summarize, the task at hand is to solve a large, system, relatively large system of linear couple differential equations. So what I should have said earlier and I forgot to say is that up until, uh, um, for as, as far as CMB and isotropies are concerned, all these perturbations, for example, the baryon over density uh, or the cold dark matter over density or the perturbations of the photon uh, phase space density away from a perfect black body or the perturbation of neutrino phase space density away from a perfect Fermi derived distribution, they are all very small. And so we can linearize all these equations and solve a system of linear equations. Those are actually uh, partial differential equations, but once you write them in Fourier space, and once you do some tricks for the photons, you can write them in terms of ordinary differential equations. So to, to summarize the variables at hand, in terms of the metric, the space time, or uh, the variables quantifying gravity, we have the Newtonian-like potentials, phi and psi, with the gravitational waves in principle also, then in terms of the different components, baryons again are described by their background ionization fraction. They're described by their temperature and they're described by their perturbations away from uh, homogeneity in terms of their over density and their uh, bulk velocities. Cold dark matter uh, to the, in the simplest scenario, of course one can come up with dark matter which has bound states, et cetera. But in the simplest scenario, all we need is the fluid variables of overdensity and velocity. And photons and neutrinos are both described by their phase space distributions or photon occupation number or neutrino occupation number, uh, which are which satisfy on the in the case of the photons a collision all Boltzmann equation, and in the case of neutrinos, a collision less Boltzmann equation. Okay, so because it's a system of linear uh, 
uh, equations. I mean, for any system of equations, you need some initial conditions, but the system of linear equations, the solution will be linearly related to the initial conditions. So there are many, uh, in principle, ways to set. There's a lot of freedom, in principle, in setting initial conditions, given all these PCs. But it turns out that observations are consistent with a very specific kind of initial condition, which is also some kind that makes sense uh, naturally arises from single field uh, inflation. And as I think Valerie will describe in more detail. And so this is called adiabatic initial conditions. This is when the fluctuations in the number densities of all the species are the same. So different patches of the universe are identical uh, in terms of the ratios of photons to baryons and ratios of photons to dark matter and to neutrinos. But compared to uh, the background, they fluctuate from place to place. Now, for uh, how does this relate to our fluid variables? So for baryons, the number, the mass density is just, or for cold dark matter, uh, if they're not relativistic, the mass density rho is just the mass of a particle times the number density n. So the relative fluctuation is the same. So delta b and delta c is just equal to this delta n over n. For relativistic species, i.e photons or neutrinos when they start in the early universe. The number density, again, always scales as a to the minus three. The temperature of any uh, relativistic species is basically the characteristic momentum. So it scales as a to the minus one. So the number density scales as t cubed. The energy density scales as t to the fourth. And so you see that if you take the logarithmic derivatives, that the fractional, fractional change in number density is three quarters of the fractional change in energy density. So we could have chosen to describe photons and neutrinos by their delta, meaning the number density fluctuation, but it's typically, uh, we use delta for energy density fluctuations, hence this factor of three quarters. Um, and uh, you need to specify not only densities, but also velocities. So on, uh, very large scales, which are larger than the Hubble radius. Uh, we start when you start on scales before they enter the uh, horizon. Uh, the peculiar velocities initially vanish. vanish. So I uh, only uh, will not give any details about this because Valerie Domke said she will cover it in, I think, her fourth lecture. Uh, metric perturbations. Uh, can they be decomposed into scalar parts, which are these fine psi potentials, so basically parts which, under rotations of the spatial coordinates, transform as a scalar, vector parts, and tensor parts. The tensor parts are the gravitational waves. So the vector modes decay, and we are they are typically uh, neglected and. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them anymore. We will focus on assume basically scalar modes, and I will briefly touch on uh, tensor modes and how gravitational waves uh, would leave an imprint in, for example, the CMB polarization pattern in probably the last uh, lecture. So if we define in this adiabatic conditions, this delta n over n as zeta, uh, these scalar modes, it turns out, are related to also this zeta. And this data is the primordial uh, curvature uh, perturbation. So basically, the takeaway message here is that we, if you assume scalar initial conditions and adiabatic initial conditions, everything is related to one single initial variable, which is this zeta, okay, which is this primordial curvature perturbation, which uh, the statistical properties of which are predicted by inflationary models. So this data, as I just said, is not predicted. Uh, we don't, there's no model that tells you where data as a function of space, what exactly is the, is the three dimensional field distribution of data. However, uh, inflationary models do predict the statistical properties of data. So the uh, simplest inflationary models and as well as what is observed in the universe, what is inferred from you know, looking at the statistical properties of CMB and isotropies and large scale structure, inferring what were the initial properties of uh, the curvature perturbation, what is observed that they are consistent with Gaussian. When you have a Gaussian uh, 
statistical random Gaussian variable. It is described simply by its variance or by in Fourier space by its variance per uh, wave number volume integral, which is the power spectrum. So here, this equation works in the Fourier domain. K is the Fourier wave number. This is just a Dirac function. And this P zeta is the uh, power spectrum of the prime module curvature perturbation. What this power spectrum tells you, as I was saying, is that if you compute the variance at any given point in space, so like uh, I'm following the same uh, ambiguous notation as, as everywhere, which is depending on whether if I put an X or a K, you know that I'm talking about the real space or the Fourier space uh, variable. So the variance of perturbations is the integral over all Fourier modes of the power spectrum of zeta. And if I write this in terms of a d log k, this brings a k cube over two pi squared, p zeta. So this stuff in red here is the variance of primordial curvature perturbations per log k interval. Now, uh, slower inflation, and again, Valerie will explain this uh, hopefully in uh, probably in her lecture, uh, predicts that this is nearly uh, scale invariance. So one of two of the cosmological parameters. So I already introduced the omegas. So we have omega b, omega c, little h, or like omega lambda. And then we have an additional, two additional cosmological parameters, which is the amplitude of the primordial curvature perturbation at some reference scale. This k star is fixed. I don't know, it could be 0.01 inverse megaparsec, whatever you fix it. And ns, if ns was exactly equal to one, this would no longer depend on k, it would be strictly scale invariant. But if ns equal is uh, slightly less than one, as is the case, then this has some small uh, scale dependence, okay? So those are two parameters. In the simplest case, you can add more, but in the simplest uh, case, initial conditions are parameterized by only two numbers, an amplitude and a slope. Okay, so, um, I don't know if there are any questions because I'm sorry, I kind of moved my chat. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, Yatsin. There were a few questions about the meaning of psi and phi, how they relate to the gravitational potential, and also the, the curvature perturbation zeta. So some people seem to be um, slightly confused maybe uh, just an explanation of what they mean. That seems to be kind of sum up uh, a few of the questions we had here in the chat. Okay, 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 okay. Let's uh, me go back to the uh, perturbed Friedman metric here. Okay. So let's start by phi and psi. So uh, if you study general relativity for not an expanding universe, if you just consider a metric where A is one. Okay. One of the things you learn is that the Newtonian limit of general relativity corresponds, so the Newtonian potential corresponds to the perturbation of the TT part of the metric. In the sense that if you have particles which move slowly with respect to the speed of light, if you have a matter distribution which changes on a, small, on a long time scale, um, in the sense that you can, if you neglect the time variation of uh, the potential, the, the uh, equations of motions of particles are dv dt is minus grad psi, where psi is specifically the term here. So this term here can be really thought of the Newtonian potential. Now this term here does not matter for the motions of non-relativistic particles. So it could be anything, it doesn't matter. It does matter for the motions of photons. Uh, for example, for gravitational lensing and also for uh, the motion of photons for the Boltzmann equation. Now, it turns out that the difference between, so I haven't written down these equations and maybe I'll, I'll write them at some point if time permits, but the, uh, these perturbations to the metric are determined from the matter content through Einstein's field equations. Uh, and so the, uh, difference between phi and psi as I've written them there. I note that sometimes people use phi with a plus sign, so there's a, some sign convention, but here the way I've written them, phi minus psi is sourced by the so-called anisotropic stress of the matter content. 
So if you have a purely, uh, for example, if you have a pure ideal fluid, which has uh, an isotropic velocity distribution or an isotropic momentum distribution, such as photons in the early universe or baryons, then phi and psi would be exactly identical. So phi is, would be basically a copy of this Newtonian potential. In reality, they have some small differences. Uh, so yeah, phi and psi both matter for photons. And then, um, yes, uh, in terms of the curvature perturbation, uh, so the, you can compute the Ricci scalar uh, of any metric. So that you can compute the Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor, which is some contraction of it, and the Ricci scalar. And the curvature perturbation is uh, up probably up to some rescaling, but I think it's actually exactly the perturbations to the Ricci scalar, if I am uh, remembering correctly. But the point is, sorry, where? Was I? The point is, you can think of it as there. Once you determine the initial Newtonian potential, the Newtonian, the relativistic version of the Newtonian potential, phi or psi, so they're going to be equal because there are no anisotropic stress in the early universe. Everything is really an ideal fluid without anisotropic stress. This you can just think of it as just some a numerical factor. It doesn't really matter uh, very much. The uh, uh, number of perturbations are also related to, uh, with some numerical factor, to the same perturbations of the potential. And I think Valerie will explain this also, this uh, adiabatic perturbations. I don't know if it was a good explanation, but sorry. Uh, oh, excellent. So there, there are also two questions about uh, by Sergi Nadal and Morteza about uh -huh. the variance of the fluctuations. They require normalization, how they're related to the, um, to the Gaussian distribution, in which sense they are an amplitude of a Gaussian that, that's related to a Gaussian distribution. That seems to be yeah. the two questions there. Maybe you can ask them, answer them quickly. Okay, so if we look at this equation, so first of all, I'll point out that there needs to be some cutoffs here, because if you really took something that is completely scale invariant, this would diverge. So let's assume that this is upscale invariant up to some maximum k and down to some minimum k. Okay, so I have some k min and some k max. Now, this gives me a variance. So now, at any given point zeta uh, x in space, saying that the distribution is Gaussian is saying that the probability distribution of zeta of x is going to be proportional to e to the minus one half of zeta of x squared divided by this thing, okay, which is the variance. So literally at any point in space, the probability distribution of zeta is Gaussian distributed with this variance. Moreover, if I have one point here and a neighboring point there, I cannot have random distribution of zeta here and zeta there. They are correlated. So I have, if I ask what is the joint probability distribution of the amplitude of zeta here and the amplitude of zeta there, I can also compute, so here I'm only computing the variance, but what you can compute is the covariance matrix, the two by two covariance matrix of zeta of x, zeta of y. So you're gonna have a two by two matrix where the two uh, diagonals are these variances and the two off diagonals are the so-called correlation function which the correlation function turns out, you can, that's actually would be a good exercise. Maybe I'll put this in the problems for next, next time. The correlation function is the Fourier transform of the power spectrum. So this power spectrum tells you not only the variance, but also how neighboring points are, have uh, variances which are correlated. So given this power spectrum, you can basically compute and you can go beyond, you can compute the statistics of n points, the joint distribution of n points, it's entirely determined by this single function of k, the power spectrum. So perhaps we can take more questions later because I want to end with a bit of a qualitative description of what we will do in the next lectures. So um, I understand there was already a bit of technicalities I was uh, trying to get people so if you, if you have not seen any of the things I've described, 
you should read a cosmology textbook. Uh, it's going to be difficult to follow, perhaps. Don't give up, read the textbook, learn about the, the basics of cosmology. So if this went over your head, I just want to give you a bit of a qualitative description of the physics of the CMB. Uh, and this is what we're going to put into equations in the next lectures. So in lecture two, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to talk about this process of recombination. As time goes on to the right, or as the temperature decreases in the universe, we start with ionized protons and electrons. And as time goes on, they get bound to um, neutral hydrogen atoms uh, more and more. This matters for the CMB Y because in the early universe, as long as electrons, there are lots of free electrons. And remember that also as time goes on, the densities are getting smaller and smaller because the universe is expanding. So photons are going to very frequently scatter off free electrons. And so the, basically the universe is opaque because you don't see anything coming only, you, you would see only things coming from really nearby from the last time they scattered off a free electron. Up until a moment where the density of free electrons is sufficiently low, the universe is mostly neutral and it's uh, sufficiently dilute that photons scatter one last time. And then they propagate called the uh, last scattering arc. Uh, Rogelio, can you still hear me? Because it says my internet connection is unstable. I just want to make sure that I'm still. We, we could hear you OK. It was a bit choppy, but it was fine. Go ahead. Don't worry. OK. All right. Let, let me know if there's any issue with the internet. So this moment of last scattering is when photons scatter for one last time and then propagate for the uh, unimpeded for the rest of the, the universe's uh, history. It takes place again, uh, again about 400,000 years after the Big Bang at a temperature of about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, corresponding to a redshift of about uh, 1,000 or 1,100. OK. Now, these photons, just to put things in terms of in context, when they last scatter, they propagate all the way through large distances and also large time. So they scatter when the universe was really, really young, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and they go through the first stars, first proto-galaxies, modern galaxies, and reach us today at the present time. As they do so, they redshift. Their initial temperature of 3,000 degrees appears as today as three degrees. Now, we are not at the center of the universe. Let's be very clear about this but we are the center of our observed universe. So from our point of view, these photons, which have scattered for the last time at the last scattering epoch, appear as if they have scattered from a last scattering two-dimensional surface uh, that's around us. In fact, the surface has some width and tomorrow we're gonna compute the probability distribution of uh, last scattering of CMB photons. And so these photons appear as if they're coming from all around us. And this is what we see as the cosmic microwave background. It's this map of photons coming from all around us and whose temperature today is roughly three degrees Kelvin. It's 2.73 degrees Kelvin. So what are we seeing exactly? So this is the whole point of uh, these CMB calculations to understand what we are seeing uh, in these maps. So before last scattering, so by the way, in terms of the vocabulary that we're gonna be using, this propagation of photons between last scattering and us, we're gonna describe it through the line of sight integral. This is going to be in lecture four. And then what we will describe before scattering, we're going to talk about fluid equations. OK, so before scattering, photons and baryons are very tightly coupled to one another. Photons keep bumping off of the free electrons because of Thomson scattering. Now, if you have photons on their own, they, have, they move at the speed of light. And the pressure is basically the trace of the momentum flux. And so the pressure of photons is one third of their energy density. So they have a huge pressure. However, on their own, they would not be confined. So it's if you have a lot of pressure, but you don't have anything to confine things, photons would just freely uh, uh, move freely. Baryons have a much smaller pressure. Uh, effectively, baryons on their own would be effectively cold on all the scales of interest for CMB and isotropies. But unlike photons, they uh, do not have an anisotropic stress. They are contained. They do not free stream. And when you couple them together, uh, they get both 
pressure, a large pressure from the photons and both containment, no free streaming from the baryons. And so they become an ideal fluid with a large pressure. Now suppose that you know, we have, as I was saying, we have initial conditions which are described statistically. So we have initial, we described it in terms of the initial gravitational potentials, and, you know, the perturbations to the metric, et cetera, but you can also think of it as initial overdensities. Uh, so suppose we have some initial overdensity and we have this fluid which has a large pressure. This initial overdensity is gonna launch a sound wave. This sound wave is going to propagate for as long as photons and baryons are indeed tightly coupled together and do indeed form an ideal fluid with a large pressure. After 400,000 years, photons are released from the confinement of baryons and the sound wave propagation stops. Now, in reality, you don't have a single overdensity which is isolated. As I was saying, you have the statistical uh, overdensities. Okay? You have basically a, a random field, a Gaussian random field as the initial conditions. So really what you see, what happens is that you have a superposition of many incoherent sound waves, which will oscillate for about 400,000 years, okay? And this 400,000 years, this, what I was showing here as, what shows as a, as a circle, it would really be a sphere. This is the sound horizon of photons. This is the distance traveled by sound waves during uh, the first 400,000 years up until last scattering. And as you see in here, it doesn't show anymore, even though I really just use the same equations here. This is a very simplified, by the way, uh, solution of these equations, but it would show statistically in the power spectrum of the CMB, the sound horizon. So now this, the idea is that the last snapshot of this incoherent oscillations is what you see as the cosmic microwave background. Okay, and not only temperature fluctuations, but also polarization fluctuations. So now because initial conditions are really described only through their uh, stochastic properties, the power spectrum, and because CMB temperature in the, uh, as long as we assume linear theory, they're linearly related to the initial conditions, they will also be described by the same statistical properties. So if initial conditions are Gaussian, so will be the uh, observed temperature uh, fluctuations. And so the corresponding quantity for angular distribution instead of three-dimensional spatial distribution is the so-called angular power spectrum. So it's a POK, PFK have a C of L. So this measures the variance of fluctuations as a function of angular scales. So small L, here correspond to very large angular, angular scales. So basically the angular scale is something like two pi over L in radians or something like 200 over L in degrees. So as you increase little L, you see that you're probing uh, smaller and smaller angular scales of the CMB. And the amplitude on this plot here is the, the amplitude of the variance. So as we go towards the peak of the spectrum, you see that here you have a higher contrast. You have more, sharper blues and sharper reds. Okay, so the CMB has a higher uh, amplitude on this first peak. And then, um, so those peaks correspond to the harmonics of the sound horizon, as we will describe in the next lectures. And as you go down here, these are very, very small scales, but also it has exponentially decreasing amplitudes. And this is because of the fusion damping. So uh, as I was briefly showing before, what you, the, the name of the game then is to uh, compare these measured data points and to try and fit uh, a cosmological model to this data. And it turns out that the CMB is fit, the statistics of the CMB are fit extremely well with only six cosmological parameters. So again, the six parameters are two for the initial conditions, two for baryon and dark matter abundance, one for, you can think of it as either the uh, abundance of dark energy today or the Hubble parameter today. And the last, the sixth one is the optical death to reionization, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, where was I? Yes, so as an introduction to tomorrow's lecture, why is the recombination history important? 
So the observable, again, is the CMB power spectrum in temperature polarization. There's also a cross power spectrum. So here I'm showing in dash the standard recombination history. And I'm going to add artificially a bump a little bit. So this here is the fraction, is the number of free electrons. I should have said this before, divided by the number of hydrogen atoms. So because we have helium, which contains two electrons and is 8% of uh, hydrogen, it starts at 1.16. So I'm going to add a bump and I'm going to move it in time. And you see how it propagates the effect to the observed, the, the predicted power spectrum. Okay, so this is a huge bump compared to what can be observed. This would be completely ruled out. The, so the, my point here is to show you that understanding the ionization history of the universe is uh, key to, as a very important point, part of the theory uh, behind modeling CMB power spectra. And in fact, one of the ways that people have tried, but so far not really succeeded in solving the Hubble tension is by trying to have some form of non-standard ionization history uh, in the hope that it would uh, you know, compensate for this difference in Hubble parameters. Okay, so once again, as I was saying before, once you have a very good understanding of the theoretical model, and if you master your, your recombination history and everything, all the physics that goes in here, you can use the CMB to measure everything, uh, all these quantities, baryon abundance, cold dark matter abundance. This is related to the Hubble parameter. This is the angular scale of the sun horizon, these amplitude and slope of the promoter power spectrum, and this optical depth theory ionization, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Okay, so this is the end of this lecture. Uh, the plan for the next lectures. Tomorrow, I will talk about the re cosmological recombination, and I will try to give you as many as much details as possible, uh, but it will still be incomplete. The day after tomorrow, I will derive the uh, Boltzmann equation for photons. So this is a central piece of the physics of CMB and isotropies is this Boltzmann equation. Codes that solve uh, for CMB and isotropies are called Boltzmann codes for this reason. The day after this, we will discuss solutions to the Boltzmann equation in different regimes. We will discuss the line of sight solution, which is also a very important, uh, which uh, was derived by uh, Seljak and Zaldariaga. It's a way to solve for the Boltzmann equation that really sped up up calculations. And we will also describe this acoustic oscillations of the photon baryon fluid. And in lecture five, uh, I will very briefly discuss more advanced uh, topics uh, in not as much detail as this first lecture. So we'll briefly tell you about CME polarization, uh, how it can be used, for example, to, uh, to detect primordial gravitational waves, or very briefly tell you about CMB lensing. And I haven't yet fully decided, but I will also probably tell you a little bit about how one can infer cosmological parameters from uh, observed data. I will give you the bit of the theorist's understanding of uh, data analysis. So I will stop here and uh, I'll take more questions if there are more questions. Okay, hey, thanks a lot, Yassini. Excellent lecture. Um, we can. Uh, I'm just going to remind everybody that we can keep some of the questions for the Q and A session. So uh, if your question just you know fell behind here in the chat list, you can bring it up back in the uh, Q and A session. But also that there are specific Slack channels for each one of the lectures. So that's also a good place for you to ask questions, and then sometimes even your colleagues can answer. Um, so I don't know if we have uh, urgent questions. We can break now for, for the Q&A unless there are some urgent issues. Rogério, what do you think we can break now? Yeah, sure. You're the chair, so <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not autocratic chair. So good, excellent. So thanks, Yassine. So uh, we will uh, reconvene in about one hour and a half for the Q&A session. Thanks everybody. And I'll see you guys soon. Thanks a lot, Yasin.